ערב טוב. Good evening. פרופסור דייוויד הראל, פרזידנט של הישראלי אקדמי של סיינסס והומניטיז, פרופסור ריצ'רד דוקינס, our esteemed speaker, members of the Academy, dear audience here and online. Unfortunately, Professor Yadin Dudai, chair of the Academy Division of Sciences, who was supposed to open this evening's special event, was unable to come, and I was asked to replace him. I'm Yossi Loya, Professor Emeritus at the School of Zoology, Tel Aviv University, and member of the Israeli Academy of Sciences. I'm sure, Yadin, that you are watching us online. We all wish you fast recovery. I'm honored and immensely pleased to open the first annual lecture of the Israeli Academy of Sciences and Humanities in memory of Charles Darwin, and pleased to invite Professor El, the president of the Academy, to the podium. Thank you, Yossi. Um, my first three or four lines are exactly the same as his. So. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Academy member Professor Yossi Loya for agreeing to replace Professor Yadin Dudai as chair of this evening. Dear members of the Academy and the Darwin Lecture Steering Committee, our dear, dear guest, Professor Richard Dawkins from the University of Oxford, and of course, all of you who have joined us here physically at the Jerusalem Theater, despite the weather and despite the convoy coming up on road number one, including various groups of youngsters who are with us today from the Davidson Institute of Science Teaching in Rehovot, uh, and the many, many people watching us online. I would first like to express our deepest sympathy towards the people of Turkey and Syria Sorrowful condolences to the families of those who lost their lives in the earthquakes, heartfelt hopes for the full recovery of the many wounded, and sincere encouragement to the leaders and governments of the two countries. May they find the wisdom and strength to deal with the aftermaths of this terrible catastrophe. The Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities is proud to institute the first annual Charles Darwin Memorial Lecture, a new lecture series initiated by our previous uh, president, Professor Nili Cohen. The Darwin Lecture is a most welcome addition to our two existing memorial lecture series, the Albert Einstein Lecture, administered by our Sciences Division, and the Martin Buber Lecture, administered by the Humanities Division. The Darwin Lecture Series is intended to cover topics spanning both divisions, including the environment, evolution, climate, and biology, but also the social and intellectual and maybe historical aspects that they raise. Today, to launch this new series, we are delighted and really honored to host the world-renowned evolutionary biologist and author, Professor Richard Dawkins. More about our speaker in a minute, but first a few words about Darwin himself. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution sparked a true revolution, scientific, obviously, but also social, cultural, and religious. And in all of these, the new ideas were accompanied immediately by ferocious controversy, the bulk of which had to do with the feeling that Darwin was really replacing the role of a divine plan that governs the world with some kind of dry, calculated, natural order. Over the years, the theory of evolution also spawned several interesting variants and counterproposals in an attempt to explain additional newly discovered phenomena which are not always adequately explained by Darwin's original work. 
In my opinion, one of the most interesting of these was initiated a few years ago by Professor Yaron Cohen from the Weizmann Institute, who dubbed it survival of the fitted to contrast with Darwin's survival of the fittest. This approach is centered on the idea that better survival and reproduction depend on the ability to cooperate with others, to fit in rather than to be fit. For the sake of full disclosure, my group and I are collaborating with your own uh, on his approach. However this may turn out, the theory of evolution with its far-fetching ramifications, its variants and improvements, and the deep controversies coming in their wake are still very much alive and kicking even today. A significant amount of the research on evolution has centered on the gene as a mechanism of natural selection. And one of the most well-known key researchers who brought this to the forefront of public awareness is Professor Richard Dawkins. He referred to genes as self-replicating replicating units, replicators. Genes that replicate themselves successfully are the most capable. They are the ones that have what it takes to produce strong successes. And excuse me for being so very, very superficial about this. Interestingly, Dawkins' principle of replication applies to religion too, where beliefs are replicated from their originator to initial followers, and then on and on to future generations. And this is true for many religions. The Jewish version of this is best manifested at the beginning of Pirkei Avot. Moshe kibel Torah misinai, mesara li Yoshua, vi Yoshua li zkenim, uzkenim lenviim, unviim mesarua lanshei kneset agdola. Moses received the Torah from at Sinai and transmitted it to Joshua, Joshua, Joshua to the elders, and the elders to the prophets, and the prophets to the men of the great assembly. Not uncharacteristically, Professor Richard Dawkins, in his book, The God Delusion, takes sweeping issue with this, asserting that believers are victims of their religion and that faith undermines the power of education, science, and rationalism. Whatever any of our own personal views on this are, at the present time, especially in view of the incredibly fast changes that are taking place here in Israel as we speak, one cannot be wary and vigilant enough. As if it were commissioned especially for a Darwin lecture given by Dawkins, Charles Darwin himself, in the introduction to his later book, The Descent of Man, wrote as follows, quote, Ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. It is those who know little and not those who know much who so positively assert that this or that problem will never be solved by science." End of quote. Besides the fact that it is Richard Dawkins who is with us today in person, you may wonder why would I bring up this particular quote right now here in Jerusalem. Well, a few years ago, our new Minister of Finance openly declared, and I'm quoting, that the theory of evolution is passé, and, it is, and that it is ridiculous to think that we come from the apes. Is this a case of ignorance begetting confidence? Perhaps. However, my concern is not with the ignorance itself, but it is with the harm that it may very well cause. Suffice it to remember that the Ministry of Finance is the body that, among many other things, is tasked with allotting the government budgets for Israel's research, scientific infrastructure, and education. Ignorance rears its ugly head with potentially outrageous implications, not only with regard to evolution. Global warming, one must state very clearly, is not a farce either, as some may have you believe. And the climate crisis will not be solved through magical or religious practices, not by Choni HaMe'agel, Choni the circle maker, nor by the rituals of the Iteso tribe in East Africa. Similarly, future pandemics, if, God forbid, God forbid, they occur, will not be, will not be eradicated 
by version 2.0 of the copper snake, Nachash HaNechoshet, or by various Christian liturgical processions. Alarmingly, several other key figures in the new administration share even darker and more dangerous views of science, education, and culture, not to mention the essentially unrelated notions of equality, freedom, democracy, civil rights, and peace. One of those people, for example, has been handed the responsibility for certain crucial parts of Israel's school system curricula, torn away for that purpose from the Ministry of Education. With our youngsters being on the receiving side of such views, coupled with the fact that early age openness, a healthy approach to critical thinking, and a broad, multifaceted school education constitute the flowerbed from which excellent scientific work eventually sprouts, the prospects of Israel's science and technology being able to maintain its cutting edge quality in the years to come seem, right now at least, to be bleak indeed. Given the direction and speed at which things are happening in many areas, not only the, judici the judicial upheaval, I have found it necessary over the past few weeks to voice these grave concerns as part of the Academy's obligation prescribed by law to advise the government on such issues. By the way, the process might eventually even hit the Israel Academy itself as notorious examples from other times and other places definitely show. I would like to mention another important national body, the Israel Science Foundation, or the ISF, our main internal research funding agency, which is roughly analogous to Britain's research councils and to the American NSF. The person, the person serving as president of the Israel Academy also chairs the council of the ISF, Moetzet Akeren, so I am quite familiar with its ins and outs. Virtually every serious Israeli scientist seeks ISF funding, and the foundation, working in a totally independent, professional, and impartial manner, awards close to 750 research grants a year, selected out of about 2,200 proposals in all areas of science and humanities. Almost all of the ISF's budget comes from the government, but it is anyone's guess as to whether under the present regime this level of support will remain stable. Moreover, given the nature of some of the people at the helm and their views, it is not totally outlandish to ask ourselves whether the ISF might at some point be required to adhere to guidelines and preferences regarding the kinds of research it funds. Here is another more tangible concern. The ISF grants are awarded on the sole basis of potential excellence in research, and its scientific teams work extremely hard to select the very best proposals for funding. Soliciting external reviews from top scientists around the world is the central part of this process, and roughly 20,000 such international review requests are sent out each year. External reviewing is thus the most critical factor in the ISF's ability to identify true excellence. We are still at the beginning of this, this year's review process, but there is already a somewhat nagging feeling that we may see a significant increase in the number of explicit refusals to review. Of course, I'd be very happy, I'd be most happy, to be proven wrong. But a blow to the ISF's ability to evaluate Israeli scientists' proposed research because a sizable portion of international experts decide to stay away from reviewing the reviewing process could, if it indeed happens, have a devastating long-term impact on the very quality of our science, on our crucial ability to collaborate with colleagues worldwide, and yes, also on the magnitude of the brain drain phenomenon. As a derivative, this might also affect Israel's high-tech and pharma-tech industries, which in turn are central to our economic, economic potency. It is no accident that in the last couple of weeks, these industries are themselves beginning to suffer 
from what I may call a money drain or investment drain trend, with, which is the alarming financial analogue of a brain drain. At the very least, we must be wary following things very closely. However, let it be known that I, we, will muster all our strength in fighting any attempts to cut budgets for research and higher education, to curtail the freedom of thought that is the basis for innovation and advancement, or to restrict the independence of national bodies that exist solely for the benefit of the country and its future, such as the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities and the Israel Science Foundation. But enough about all that. This evening is intended to be exciting and eye-opening, and while it is our duty to sound the warning, we do not have the privilege to lose hope. This was put most elo eloquently by one of history's most revered, revered champions of freedom of all kinds, Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. Quote, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. I would like to express the Academy's deepest gratitude to you, Professor Dawkins, for honoring us today and to thank our wonderful staff for the perfect organization of this event. I wish us all a very enjoyable evening. Thank you very much. I am delighted and excited to introduce our eminent speaker tonight, Professor Richard Dawkins, who is no doubt the most outstanding scientist and author one could have imagined for inaugurating the first annual lecture of the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities in memory of Charles Darwin. Professor Hawkins, Dawkins, I'm sorry, <laughs> whom I take the liberty of describing as the highest preacher of evolution in our generation, is very well known worldwide for his uniquely scholarly interpretation and explanation of the theory of evolution, for his criticism of creationism and intelligent design, as well as for being a vocal atheist. In addition to much scientific research, theoretical and conceptual papers, Dawkins published 20 books that analyze, explain, and popularize evolution. His books were translated into many languages, including Hebrew, and I believe many of you have read quite a few of them. Richard Dawkins was born in Nairobi, Kenya, where his father was stationed on His Majesty's service during World War II. The family returned to England in 1949 when Richard was eight years old. He lived in Oxford and described his childhood as a normal Anglican upbringing. I hope I'm right. In his teenage years, he concluded that the theory of evolution was a much better explanation for life's complexity than religion and became a passionate atheist. He studied zoology at Balliol College, Oxford, where he received a bachelor's degree in zoology in 1962. Richard remained at Oxford earning master's and doctorate degrees in zoology in 1966 tutored by Nobel Prize-winning ethologist Nicholas Tinbergen. Dawkins, Dawkins 
assisted Timbergen before becoming an assistant professor of zoology at the University of California, Berkeley. He returned to Oxford to lecture in zoology in 1970, received a DSC from the University of Oxford in 89, and served as a reader in zoology at the University of Oxford, where he continued conducting research focusing on models of animals' decision-making. And then from 1995, as the Charles Simoni Professor of the Public Understanding of Science at Oxford and Professional Fellow of New College in Oxford. Professor Docking first came to prominence outside the professional scientific community with his 1976 book, The Selfish Gene, and in Hebrew we say it's Agen Aenochi. He popularized the idea that replicating genes are the central force behind evolution, not individual organisms or species, and tried to rectify what he maintained was a widespread misunderstanding of Darwinism. In this book, he coined the term meme, which is the behavioral equivalent of a gene, as a way to encourage readers to think about how Darwinian principles might be extended beyond the realm of genes. In his 1982 book, the extended phenotype, he introduced into evolutionary biology the influential concept that the phenotypic effects of a gene is not limited to the body and cells or an organism, but can stretch far into the environment. For example, when a beaver builds a dam. To my mind, Richard, this book is one of your most significant contributions to science, and I hope you agree. You agree. <laughs> In review, you don't have a choice. <laughs> In reviewing Richard's books, I could easily take the entire lecture time, so I'll just give you a glimpse on some of his books that were translated also into Hebrew. And I chose to mention them, Richard, so that you can listen to their sign, to their sound in Hebrew. 1986, The Blind Watchmaker, Hasha'an Ha'iver. A strong critique, which is a strong critique of the theory of intelligent design, which won the Royal Society Literature Award and the Los Angeles Times Literary Prize, arguing against the watchmaker analogy, an argument for the existence of the supernatural creator based upon the complexity of living organisms. Instead, he describes evolutionary processes as analogous to a blind, to a blind watchmaker in that reproduction, mutation, and selection are unguided by any sentient designer. 1996, Climbing Mount Improbable. In Hebrew, Atipus Alahara Bilti Savir, Masa Beolchota Evolutia. Point out that Intricate structures, for example, the eye, do not manifest randomly, but instead successively increase in sophistication. 1998, Unweaving the Rainbow, and in Hebrew, Lifrom et Akeshet Be'anan, Ashlaya Uchukata Plia, contending that evolutionary theory is aesthetically superior to supernatural explanations of the world. 2006, Dawkins founded the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science and published his book, The God Delusion, and in Hebrew, Yesh Elohim Siman She'ela, A'ashlaya Agdola Shel Adat. 
contending that a supernatural creator almost certainly does not exist, and that religious faith is a delusion. More than three million copies were sold in English language edition and been translated into 31 other languages. Interestingly, an unauthorized Arabic translation of this book has been loud, downloaded three million times in Saudi Arabia. 2009, greatest show on earth, Atzagag Dola Betevel, Areayot Beschuta Evolutia. 2011, the magic of reality, how we know what's really true. Kesem HaMetziut, Ech Anachnu Yodim Ma Amiti Uma Lo. A book for young readers that contrasts the scientific understanding of various phenomena with mythologies that intend to explain them. Richard Dawkins was awarded a plethora of honors and awards throughout his prolific career as a scientist, as an author, and as both combined, including more than 10 honorary doctorates in science from various universities around the world, as well as numerous international scientific and literary prizes and awards. I apologize, Richard, but I'm looking at my watch. So I'll keep listing them. They are amazingly numerous. Richard, as we have already heard in Professor Earl's introduction, I am sure that you are aware of the complex times our society in Israel confronts these difficult days. Being a vocal atheist and the highest preacher of evolution in our generation, I am so happy and excited that you have arrived at Israel to Jerusalem at the right time and at the right place. We are eagerly awaiting your future, your future books, uh, from a recent interview with you in the Israeli newspaper, Haaretz, I understand that your next book you expect, you expect to publish is called The Genetic Book of the Dead, Sephra Genetica Shalametim. Looking forward to read it. In the meantime, it is our immense pleasure and honor to welcome you as the first invited speaker of the first annual lecture in memory of Charles Darwin of the Israeli Academy of Sciences and Humanities entitled Darwin Five Bridges. Professor Dawkins, the floor is yours. <laughs> 